new proclamations. What wise men, great men, medical men, professional people have not been able to do, God will do it. All those things that are forgotten, your forgotten strength, your forgotten power, your forgotten revelation, everything you said, I had a dream long ago. And I thought, this is what I will do. I've forgotten now, your forgotten vision will come up again. Passion will come up again. Revelation will come up again. New life will come up again in your life in Jesus' name. Only Christ Jesus has the power of this new year. An unforgettable encounter beckons. We are connecting to the God of wonders this new year for salvation and deliverance. Welcome GCK to Asaba. Delta State, Nigeria, January 26th to 31st, 2023. 1600 hours GMT daily and Global Sunday Worship at or 700 hours GMT. Also featuring ministers and professionals conference with Impact Academy for Youth, Young Adults and Young Professionals. It's a new year of wonders this 2023. From the Niger Delta, the oil of anointing will be transported by satellite and all our social media links to over 150 countries of the world. Join the team in GCK audience as the man appointed by God, the convener of GCK, Pastor Dr. W.F. Komoi, connects the world to an unforgettable encounter with the God of Wonders. Glorious music ministrations by choirs from nations across the world with guest music ministration by Jonathan Lee. Darkness gone. Yeah. Premature death cancelled. Yeah. Yours is now to reap the benefit. GCK, the, the gospel, gospel to every creature. Let us pray. A great God in heaven, we thank you because of the Bible study tonight again. We look up to you today that the great teacher, Christ himself, will teach us as we read the pages of the scriptures in Jesus' name. And that as he has led the Holy Spirit with the church to remind us of things we've been taught before and to reveal more of Christ more of his ways and of the kingdom unto us. We pray that the Holy Spirit will take these words and apply them to our hearts and lives so that we'll be better people following after the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray, O oh Lord, that you open our eyes to see things that are hidden from the casual reader of the Bible and things we have overlooked in times past fasting upon our conscience and press upon our heart, that statement, that word, which will do us good and will prepare us for a greater fellowship and relationship with you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Today we still continue with a study of the epistle to the Colossians. But today we're looking at many verses Together, we're looking at Colossians chapter 4, from verse 7, all through to verse 18. Colossians chapter 4, verse 7 to verse 18. All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is the beloved brother, and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that he might know your estate and your comfort and comfort your heart with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you. They shall make known unto you all things that are done here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you, and Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas, touching whom you received commandments, if he come unto you, receive him. And Jesus, which is called Justus, who are of the circumcision, these only 
and my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God, for I bear him record, that he has a great zeal for you, and them that are in Laodicea, and them in Hierapolis. Luke, be the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea, and Nymphas, and the church which is in his house. And when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that she likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. The salutation by the hand of me, Paul. Remember my bonds. Grace be with you. Amen. Today, we come to the concluding verses of the epistle to the Colossians. This part of the epistle is usually omitted by many people who read the Bible casually. Why? Because they do not understand how this part of the epistle can be edifying unto them. Here you will see that Paul mentions a number of names. If you start from verse 7 and you go through to the end of the chapter, he mentions Tychicus. He mentions Onesimus. He mentions Aristarchus, Marcus. And he mentions also Justus. And then Epaphras. Then he mentions Luke, Demas, and he mentions Archippus. Who were these people? These were friends, associates, fellow laborers, fellow workers. Actually here, he's making a list of his friends and associates who have labored with him and who had been of great encouragement to him. Though a great apostle, he appreciated the faithfulness of many dear and helpful friends. These faithful friends and fellow workers were with him for many years. And they were loyal to God, many of them, not all, and were loyal to him. Faithful friends can be very helpful in life and profitable in ministry. That is what we learn from many examples in the Bible, as well as from many references of Scripture. Faithful friends can be very encouraging, very helpful, very profitable in ministry. You will remember, no doubt, the example of Moses, Aaron, and all. Joshua had gone to the battlefield against the Amalekites, and the victory depended on the raising up of the rod of the hand of Moses. And then his sons were being weakened. And these friends, associates, and fellow workers stood by him and supported his hand. Friends can be like that. Supporting the heavy hand. Supporting the heavy heart. Supporting the discouraged heart. So that we'll be able to maintain the victory. And you remember the example of David and Jonathan. How Jonathan encouraged David when David's life was in danger. And when it appears that what God had called David for, to reign, on the throne of Israel, was being threatened. How Jonathan was a great encouragement. And you will see in the case of Jeremiah. He had a secretary who also turned out to be a faithful, loyal companion and friend. And in the times of his difficulty, of his persecution, of his rejection by the children of Israel, here was somebody that stood close by him. Coming on to the New Testament, Jesus Christ himself refers to those disciples of his 
as his friend. He said, Ye are my friend. All these things I have learned from my father, I have told you. You are no more my servant. Oh yes, they were disciples. They were followers. But then there were times they acted as friends and fellow workers too. And when he said his soul was sorrowful unto death, what did he do? He chose three of them so that they will be with him. They will pray with him. Faithful friends will be very helpful in life. Very profitable in ministry. And you see the Apostle Paul. In fact, it seems that every time we have seen Paul the Apostle, it's difficult to see him alone. The first time Paul the Apostle is introduced to us, what do we learn about him? We learn about him that he was going to Damascus. He wasn't even a believer, a Christian then. You know, there were people surrounding him. We also know that immediately he became born again. And an ass came into his life to be a blessing to him. He's never been alone. And then when he got to Jerusalem, the people, the disciples and apostles would have rejected him. There was a Barnabas that came to his rescue and introduced him. As he was going to be sent out on missionary journey, you remember the word of the Lord from the Spirit of the Lord, separate unto me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. As they went on in the journey, in the ministry, we find that he was never alone. When they came back and Barnabas disappointed, the church chose Silas to go along with him. And then eventually as they were moving on, Timothy came in, Titus came in, and a lot of people came in. Until the end of his ministry, he was always being encouraged, being comforted by friends that were faithful. Let's look at Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 17. And in verse 17, A friend loveth at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. If you relate that to the life of Paul the Apostle, how he had a lot of adversity, a lot of difficulties, and he always had a friend nearby, a brother nearby, a faithful, loyal fellow soldier, fellow laborer, fellow worker nearby. A friend loveth at all times. There were people that disappointed Paul the Apostle. Demas, for example, did. Barnabas temporarily did too. Did temporarily. But then there were a lot of friends, a lot of people that stayed close to him, stuck with him, that loved at all times, that would even visit him in the prison. Some even became his fellow prisoners. And then it says, a brother is born for adversity. In Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24, a man that has friends must show himself friendly. And you see that in the life of Paul the Apostle. Timothy, a friend, a son, a fellow laborer, fellow worker. He was he at his points of weakness. Not moral weakness, physical weakness. And Paul the Apostle always showed compassion. Always get good advice that will show that Paul the Apostle made himself friendly. Do you see his concern for Epaphroditus? Do you see his concern for some of his friends that were sick? For some of his fellow laborers that got you know, into any kind of trouble? That's verse 24 again. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. If there, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. I know we can apply that very much to the Lord Jesus Christ. The friend of sinners. And a friend of the people he has brought into the kingdom. He sticks closer to us than a relative. A father, a mother, a brother, a sister. And yet, in the normal sense of the word, as we have read here, there are some Christian people. There are some Christian men and women that will stick closer to another Christian, another pilgrim on this way to heaven, closer than a relative closer than a brother. And here, Paul the Apostle lists people that had been faithful, people that had been fellow workers and associates, people that were loyal to God, and people that were profitable, encouraging to him in the ministry. As I said before, faithful friends can be very helpful in life. 
profitable in ministry. Let's see in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. He is profitable to me for the ministry. Here Paul the Apostle recognized the will of God in his life. God had put him in the ministry. And there were people that encouraged him to stay in the will of God. To stay in the ministry where God had put him. And you see there are sometimes friends that will become disloyal. And when they see that you go through some of the things that Paul the Apostle went through. Persecution, poverty, slander, criticism, imprisonment, and a lot of other kinds of havoc in life. Because of the will of God, they try to dissuade you that shouldn't you consider yourselves? Look at your poverty. Look at your need. Look at the difficulties in your life. But you see, these friends that Paul the Apostle talked about, when they saw his imprisonment, his persecution, they never used that to discourage him. To say, are you really sure you are called of God? Those are not true friends. These friends of Paul the Apostle, they encouraged him to say, in the perfect will of God. They encouraged him to say, in the very center of the will of God, through thick or thin, through the wilderness and through the persecution, and through all the difficulties, they were profitable to him in the ministry. They assisted him. They suffered with him. They encouraged him. They spent their time and money on him. And they did everything they, they ought to do. And when they ought to stay by his side, when disappointment came, they stood by his side. And they were always reminding him, you're on the right road. You're in the right place. You are doing the right thing. Don't look at the wind blowing. Don't look at the difficulties you are passing through. Those are friends. Those are friends. Those are not good friends that will say, are you really sure of the will of God? Look at all that you are going through. Those who measure the will of God by whatever they are going through. And therefore we have false friends. And false friends can be very disappointing at the time of need. False friends can be very, very disappointing at the time of need. Paul the Apostle also had some of them, but thank God they were few. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Christian, to Galicia, Titus to Dalmanuta. Here we find Demas, who disappointed Paul the Apostle. He wasn't faithful. And so sometimes we find false friends who cannot be faithful, who will yield to temptation. If our friendship with them is not giving them money, our friendship with them is not giving them good position in society, our friendship with them is not bringing them into the limelight in society. Oh, they say there is no you. And if there is an attraction, if there is a temptation to the world, then they go to the world. Second Timothy chapter 1, from verse 15. This thou knowest, that all they which were in Asia be turned away from me, of whom are Phygelius and Hermogenes. You will see over here too, there were people at the time of Paul's difficulty. They turned against him. They turned their backs on him. And so there are false friends. And our choice of friends and co-laborers can make or mar our lives and ministry. And so as we look at the passage we are studying today, and we look at the friends of Paul the Apostle, associates of Paul the Apostle, co-laborers, co-prisoners, and uh, fellow workers of Paul the Apostle, uh, you should allow God to speak to your heart. To make you know and to make you examine the kind of friends you have. There are three things we're going to look at that comes clearly from the passage. Number one, list of friends and fellow workers. Number two, the character 
of his friends and fellow workers. Number three, the ministry of his friends and fellow workers. Number one, the least of his friends and fellow workers. If you look at Colossians chapter 4, from verse 7, all through to verse 18, we have read the passage together already. Let me just remind you of the list here. The list contains these names, Tychicus, Onesimus, Aristarchus, Marcus, Justus, Epaphras, and also Luke, Demas, and Archippus. Does that exhaust the list of his friends and fellow workers? No, not at all. There, are, there were other people that we know to have been his fellow laborers, fellow workers, or fellow prisoners that are not mentioned here. Why are these then mentioned? These were known to the Colossians. Not all the friends and associates of Paul were known to the Colossians, but these were known to them. And how did he meet some of them? What impact did he have in some of their lives? Let's see some of the people that are mentioned, and some others we'll see later, who are not mentioned in Colossians, but they were his friends and fellow workers. Let's see in Acts chapter 20, verse 4. And there accompanied him into Asia, Sopata of Berea, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus, and Secundus and Gaius of Derby, and Timotheus, and of Asia, Tychicus, and Trophimus. Here we have the mention of Aristarchus, as well as the mention of Tychicus. You see, we also have mention of the names of other people alongside with them, showing you what I said earlier, that what we have in Colossians chapter 4 is not an exhaustive list. A complete list. But this is just the list of the friends and associates of Paul the Apostle that were known to the Colossian believers. Onesimus was mentioned in the letter to Philemon. Let's look at Philemon. Philemon, just before Hebrews. From verse 10. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds, here we learn that Onesimus, who was mentioned in Colossians chapter 4, had been born again through the ministry of Paul the Apostle, while Paul the Apostle was in prison at Rome. If you look at the end of Philemon, and here is something that those of us who really study the Bible should sometimes take note of. Some do not take note of these little, little things. The very... Uh, the very last uh, statement uh, after just below verse 25 reaching from Rome to Philemon by Onesimus a servant that is at this time Paul the apostle was in Rome what was he doing in Rome he was in the prison how do we know that it says in verse 10 whom I have begotten in my bonds in my imprisonment you see, even when Paul was in the prison, he was still working for the Lord. And he was still winning souls unto the Lord. Verse 11. Which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me, which I have sent again, that therefore receive him, that is my own vowel. He became so friendly, became so loyal, and he became so intimate that Paul the apostle called him, this Onesimus, he called him, my own bowels. What does that mean? My well-beloved. In verse 13, Whom I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. He might have ministered. He was profitable. A profitable friend indeed. In verse 24 of that same Philemon, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. Here, he also mentioned some names, repeating some of the names we have heard before. In Romans chapter 16, Romans chapter 16, from verse 1.
from verse 3. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles, faithful friends, dependable friends, Aquila and Priscilla. And Paul the Apostle said here in verse 4, these people have been so dedicated, so profitable, so supportive, and so protecting, that for his own life, that is for Paul's life, these people laid down their necks. And he said he's been thankful unto God for them. Not himself only, all the churches are thankful unto the Lord for them. Romans chapter 16 verse 7. Salute and Drunicus and Junior, my kinsmen, my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. Some of the people that were at known the Lord before him became fellow laborers, fellow workers, and they became friends and associates. In verse 21, Timotheus, my work fellow, and Lucius, and Jason, and Sosipata, my kinsmen, salute you. So then we see that Paul the Apostle was not alone. He had trustworthy friends. From this list of his friends, and what he said about them, and what they did, a number of things we need to learn. One, a man is known by the kind of people he surrounds himself with. Look at yourself. Look at your friends. You will eventually become what your friends are. You surround yourself with a group of people. What is in them will eventually influence you. The life, the character, and the profession of, this, of your friends will ultimately affect you either positively or negatively. Many people have been destroyed and God's purpose in their lives have not been fulfilled because of the influence of their friends, the friends they have chosen. If you are a wise Christian, a wise believer, you'll be prayerful and careful in the choice of the friends you have. Paul's friends were his fellow liberals. You see that? Paul's friends were his fellow liberals. Paul did not choose any friend that hated God. Any friend that hated the ministry that God had committed into his son. Any friend that will not agree with the purpose of God for his life. Any friend that will be discouraging him, pulling him down. His friends were his fellow liberals. If you heard that there was Paul at a friend, mark it down. It was not just a social friend. It was not just a person, a well-wisher. He was also a fellow Libra. Friend, fellow Libra, they were connected together. They loved the same Lord that he had loved. And they were addicted to the same ministry that he had consecrated his life to. He had friends and fellow workers that stayed and talked with him. In all his missionary journeys, they stayed and talked with him in his imprisonment, in his persecution and the ministry. They helped him. They encouraged him. They comforted him. They suffered with him. They labored with him. They believed the same law. They believed the same doctrine with him. As long as they were his friends, they also remained fellow workers. But listen to this. When they stopped being fellow workers, immediately, naturally, they dropped from the list of his friends. And that should be a lesson for every one of us. And that should be a pattern of life for every one of us. Let's not look at something. The character of his friends and fellow workers. That leads us to point two. What kind of people were these people? And um, if you are looking for a good friend, you yourself must be good. You are looking for a faithful friend, you yourself must be faithful. You are looking for a helpful, loyal individual, you yourself must be helpful and loyal. And the beautiful thing is this, all the qualities of character that we see in the friends of Paul the Apostle, we also see in Paul himself. It wasn't demanding from them that they should be faithful, they should be loyal, they should be holy, they should be good, and then it was the opposite. No, not at all. 
Let's look at the character. I'll just uh, look at these verses and run down and look at, the, look at the qualities of character that we see in them. We're looking at Colossians again, chapter 4, verse 7. All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. He said of this individual, one is a believer. He had no unbelieving friend. He had no sinner friend. All his associates, all his friends, all the people that were intimate with him, they knew the Lord. They knew the Lord. They couldn't have been his friend without they knowing the Lord. His message would have driven them away. His lifestyle would have driven them away. His imprisonment would have driven them away. His friends were born again people. Is that true about you? He said Tychicus was a brother. Not just an ordinary brother, a beloved brother. What made him beloved? Oh, because his life was just good. Christianly. Christ-like. And people loved him for his Christian qualities. Not only that, he was a faithful minister. Faithful to the Lord. Faithful to the word of God. Committed to the ministry. Even in the time of trial and difficulty. And a fellow servant in the Lord. That means a slave in the Lord. A fellow slave. That's the original word. What does that mean, a fellow slave? A person that will be willing to serve the church. A person that will be willing to bend in humility and meekness. To serve the people in need around him for the sake of the Lord. Verse 8. Whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose that he might know your estate and comfort your heart. This was a person with a comforting ministry. A person that will come to the uh, midst of the Colossians and when he saw their estate, he will see their need and he will have the appropriate word for the right person. Comfort. For those who are discouraged. Comfort for those who are suffering. Comfort for those who are being tempted and tried by the devil. He said, he will comfort your heart. He will not just speak some words into your mind, into your brain. He will comfort your heart. We see the character of the friends of Paul the Apostle. Verse 9. With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother. Here was a person, Onesimus, who had been a sinner. All have seen and come short of the glory of God. In his own case, he had stolen. He had stolen from Philemon, a rich master, and he had run away. And while Paul was in Rome, he met this Onesimus, and then he preached to him. And he's in, in the prison. That is, when Paul was in the prison, he got this person to the Lord. And then he said, Onesimus has become a brother, a child of God. A person, a fellow pilgrim on this highway of holiness, he too is beloved. And he too is a faithful brother. He said, who is one of you? One of you mean a Colossian. Who, that means that Onesimus had been, uh, had come from Colossae. And had been a servant of Philemon also. He said, they, referring to Onesimus and Tychicus, shall make known unto you, all things that are done here, they have been so close to Paul the Apostle that they knew of his suffering in the prison. They knew of his persecution among the Jews. They knew of his ministry to the unsaved. They knew of his ministry to the church. And he said, they will tell you, these two friends, these two fellow workers, they will tell you all things which are done here. Verse 10, Aristarchus. My fellow prisoner saluted you. This Aristarchus also had known the Lord. And he was not now suffering for the Lord with Paul the Apostle. He had given up his liberty so that he could be by the side of Paul the Apostle. And he wouldn't deny the faith even though he was in the prison. And then he said, Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas, touching whom ye received commandment. If he come unto you, receive him. This mark was the one we read about in Acts of the Apostles. When the going was tough, when the difficulty was much, he forsook them in the world. And when they were to go on the second missionary journey, to look at how the believers were doing, 
Barnabas determined that Mark must go along with them. And Paul said, it's not right. Because this is the Mark that had forsaken the work when we needed him most. And the contention, the disagreement was so sharp between Paul and Barnabas that Barnabas had to forsake Saul. But you see, even then, Paul was still looking at the life of Mark. And now he said he has been restored. His zeal has been restored. His commitment has been restored. Touching whom ye receive commandments, what happens is this. What happened is this. When Mark forsook him and Barnabas forsook him, Paul the apostle gave information to the church at Colossae. He said, these people have become unfaithful, disloyal, and they had disobeyed the heavenly calling. And Barnabas had taken Mark and had gone away to Cyprus. Therefore, have nothing to do with them. So Paul said, touching whom ye received commandments before, I told you how to act towards them when they forsook the perfect will of the Lord. Now Mark is restored. If he come unto you, now you can receive him. And then in verse 11, we read of justice. He said, it's of the circumcision. But even though it's of the circumcision, and Paul the apostle preached against the circumcision as the means of salvation, Yet this justice believed, and he accepted, and he followed after. And even though these were real committed Jews, committed Jews that had been of the circumcision, he said, they have become my fellow workers. And they never raised any eyebrow when I say Jesus is the way. When I say circumcision cannot save. When I say all the rites and all the ceremonies of the Jewish law can never save anyone. He said, they are my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. They never tore my ministry down just because they have been of the circumcision and they preach against circumcision. And every time I preach that word of God and exalt Jesus above circumcision, above the laws of Moses, they have been my comfort and my supporter. Verse 12, Epaphras is one of you, a servant of Christ. You see the character of these people that were associates of Paul the Apostle, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluted you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. We read of Epaphras here, also a dedicated, beloved person, a humble, committed individual, a servant of Christ, a slave of Christ, who will do anything for the glory of the Lord and for the exaltation, the glory of the name of Christ. It says, always laboring, night and day, always laboring, in season and out of season, always laboring, when understood and when misunderstood, always laboring, laboring fervently, very zealous, never lukewarm, persevering, never, never lukewarm, hot for the Lord, never cold, fervently for you in prayers, very prayerful, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. He said, for I bear him record. And them, and that he has a great zeal for you, and them that are in Laodicea, and them in Hierapolis, is this man prayed for the churches, and he prayed fervently. He'll pray for the church at Colossae, for the church in Laodicea, for the church in Herapolis, then he mentioned other people. Verse 14, he mentioned Luke, a beloved physician. And this is, a, we, we call him a beloved, dedicated specialist. Even though he had been a physician, if you will look at uh, the journeys of Paul the Apostle in, in uh, Acts of the Apostles, you will find that Luke was always following him. Luke wrote the gospel according to St. Luke, and he wrote the Acts of the Apostles. And every time he said, we, he said, we lose from this place, we sailed to this place, we arrived in this place, we saw these people here, we met with them in prayer. Every time he used the word we, he was in the team. He forsook his special profession so that he could be a companion in labor. For Paul, the apostle, and then he said, Demas greet you. Demas had a good beginning, but a sad ending. He didn't continue till the end. Eventually, he loved this present world. He departed. He forsook Paul the Apostle. He abandoned the work of the Lord. And he lost his love for God. 
loved not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. If any man, like Demas, loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For the things that are in the world, the things that are in the world, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, the lust of the eyes, they are not of the Father, but they are of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. What a pity that Demas did not continue in the will of God and did not abide in the ministry until the very end. He did not endure till the end. Then he said, Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and Nymphos, and the church which is in his house. And verse 16, When this epistle is read among you, cause it to be read in the church of the Laodiceans, and that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea, which, which epistle is that? That ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. Some people, because they do not understand the scriptures, they will say there are some lost parts of the Bible. And uh, just like uh, yesterday, when we studied the inspiration of scripture, and uh, different questions come in from different uh, places. And one of the questions in one of the places uh, I about uh, some parts of the Bible that uh, we cannot find that are lost. No, the Bible is complete. But I about, and this is something like uh, something that somebody could have held on to. Ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. How do you understand that? You see what happened is this. For example, the epistle to the Ephesians. If you have time and you go through the epistle to the Ephesians, you will see that personal things. Uh, related to real epistles were not really mentioned. Why? Because, you see, it was an epistle, a model epistle, sent first to the Ephesians, and then from Ephesians it went to Laodicea. It went to other places and uh, archaeology, as well as those who have, uh, as well as the science that looks into all the writings of the past. They have discovered the epistle to the Ephesians, and they would uh, come with me to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Paul chapter 1 verse 1. An apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. The Lord reveals so much to Paul the apostle in this epistle to the Ephesians that eventually what happened is this that they copied the whole of the epistle and it went to Laodicea, went to a lot of other churches. And then there have been uh, epistles found, exactly this epistle to the Ephesians. But then it says in chapter 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are at the dash. So that in, on, on that dash, you could write the name of Laodicea. You could write the name of other churches in other cities because of the complete revelation concerning the kingdom of God, concerning the body of Christ, concerning the mystery that had been hidden from generations past and then revealed in Ephesians that had been given to Paul the Apostle, it went to a lot of the churches. And it is that epistle to the Ephesians that also got to Laodicea. And the Colossians were being told, when you read this epistle to the Colossians, pass it on to Laodicea. And then the epistle to the Ephesians which has been passed on to Laodicea, they will pass it on to you, and you read that likewise that is coming from Laodicea. Now in verse 17, Colossians chapter 4, verse 17. And say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry, which thou hast received in the Lord, and that thou will feel it. Here we see the character of these um, friends and fellow workers of Paul the Apostle. Look at the note. Paul's friends and fellow workers were men of scriptural Christian experiences and men of good character. He could not have kept worldly minded people and men of doubtful character as associates and confidants. They would have destroyed him. They would have changed his mind. They would have made him to go in the other direction which is not according to the direction that the Lord wanted him to go. 
A man's character is reflected by the character of his associates and business partners. A man's character will be reflected by the character of people surrounding him. And in the case of Paul the Apostle, he just surrounded himself with people that had Christian experiences. Let us look at now 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. And you will see the character of some of his associates. Chapter 2, verse 10. Ye are witnesses. And God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we have behaved ourselves among you that believe. It's not referring only to himself. It's referring to himself and his associates, and his friends. And he said, Thessalonians, you know my associates. You know my fellow workers. You know my fellow laborers. You know my fellow prisoners. And you will see when we came to you, you saw not only my life, you saw our lives together. How did we behave among you that believed? Holily, justly, unblameably. How are your own friends? How are your own associates? What kind of character do they have? Their character will influence your character. And the character of your associates, business associates and friends, their character tell, their characters tell a lot of things about your own character too. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 22, And we have sent with them, our brother, how is this brother, whom we have often times proved diligent in many things, but now much more diligent upon the great confidence which I have in you. One of the associates of Paul the Apostle sent to these people, he said, we are sending him to you. We have proved him to be diligent in many things. We know him to be a person of good character. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Nevertheless, whereunto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing, brethren. Be followers together of me, and mark them, which walk so as ye have us for an example. The character of his friends and associates, or characters that people could look up to and appreciate. Paul's friends and fellow workers, as I said, were people of Christian experiences. They were people who were saved, sanctified, dedicated unto the Lord, completely committed to the Lord, because filled with the Spirit of God, and committed, addicted to the ministry, the ministry of the world. Look at the notes and see what we've written on some of these people that are mentioned. Tychicus was a man with a servant heart, a loyal, faithful, trustworthy, believing man. He is referred to as a beloved brother, a faithful servant, a fellow servant, a fellow slave in the Lord. How about Onesimus? He was the runaway slave of rich Philemon, who was led to Christ by Paul. And Onesimus became a faithful, beloved brother. Aristarchus, that Paul's fellow prisoner that chose to be beside Paul, to be a fellow prisoner with Paul. He chose to make Paul's lifestyle his lifestyle. He voluntarily gave up his freedom to be a prisoner with Paul the Apostle. He was willing to give up his liberty to accomplish what God wants to be accomplished. How about Mark, a man with restored vision, restored commitment, restored zeal, restored ministry, restored usefulness, just us, a man with a strong commitment, though a Jew, yet committed to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul the Apostle said, These are my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. Epaphras, he was a man with a single passion, fervent, persevering, prayerful. Luke, dedicated friend. Demas, was sorry for him, eventually abandoned Paul and forsook the Lord. Because he loved this present world. What will your own history be? 
Are you a friend to good people? Ministering people? And if you are, you are a Christian yourself, who are your friends? Who do you support and surround yourself with? Point three, ministry of his friends and fellow workers. We're not going to spend so much time on this because already we have touched on their ministry. And we have seen a lot of things that they have done. Let me just read to you verse 17. And say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord that thou fulfill it. It wasn't only Archippus that had ministry among the friends of Paul the Apostle. If you read from verse 7 all through to verse 18, you will see that all these had ministry. However, Tatticus and Onesimus, they were sent to Colossae, and they will make known unto the Colossians all things that are done here. They had ministry. However, Aristarchus in verse 10, fellow prisoner, he had ministry. Why was he being imprisoned? If he wasn't having a ministry of salvation to sinners, deliverance to, the, to those who are bound. I but Marcus is not profitable in the ministry. And I but Justus, oh, they are, these only are my fellow workers, the fellow workers unto the kingdom of God, which I comfort unto me. Epaphras, did he have a ministry? Oh, yes, he did, a servant of Christ, laboring fervently in prayers that the Colossians might stand complete in the perfect will of God. How about Luke? Did he have a ministry? Well, he wrote the gospel according to St. Luke. And how about the uh, Acts of the Apostles? He wrote the Acts of the Apostles, a great, great ministry. And he followed Paul the Apostle all about. His other associates that are not mentioned in this chapter, but mentioned in other places, like Titus, did he have a ministry? Like Timothy, did he have a ministry? You see this point? He had, Paul himself had a great ministry. And he surrounded himself with people having ministry. A man who maintains friendship with aimless wanderers, with vagabonds, will eventually himself live a useless, purposeless life. A companion of fools shall be destroyed. But in the case of Paul, his friends had ministry within the church. Do your friends have ministry within the church? Preaching sound doctrine? Supporting sound doctrine? And supporting the church of the living God? And Paul the Apostle exalt, exalted Archippus and his other friends. And he said they should fulfill the ministry that they had received in the Lord. He encouraged his friends to be loyal and faithful to the Lord and faithful to the commission of the Lord. Let's see the encouragement he gave to Timothy. In second. Timothy chapter 4, verse 5. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. We've, we've learned about Paul the Apostle today. In these closing verses of the epistle, that he had faithful friends, fellow laborers, fellow workers, fellow prisoners. And as we look at the list of his friends and fellow workers, we are challenged that we should also look at the list of our own friends, our associates, our business partners, our fellow workers. Are they the right kind of people? We should look at their character. We should look at their character, whether their character will be something that will commend us before God or condemn us before God and man. And we should look at whether our friends and associates are vagabonds, are people that have nothing doing, people that are not committed to God, people that are just wanderers, aimless people that are roaming about the street, or are they, are they people that have purpose in life, goal in life, the goal that God has set for them, has God given them something to do in the church, and they're doing it well and doing it faithfully? Let's go to the Lord in prayer, that God will help us to have friends, that will help us to fulfill the purpose of God in our lives. Arise and talk to the Lord in prayer. That God himself will help you to be careful and prayerful in choosing friends that will support the will of God in your life. Encourage the will of God in your life. Talk to the Lord in prayer. Are your friends born again? Your associates, are they born again? 
your advisors, are they born again? The people you think about, are they born again? The people you join your lot with, are they children of God? Are they beloved brethren? Are they faithful brethren? Are they loyal brethren? Are they committed and addicted to the things of God? Do they have purpose in life? Or are they aimless wanderers on the street? Talk to the Lord in prayer. Talk to the Lord in prayer. Are they people that are discouraging you, pulling you back to the world and to sin? Or are they people that even with all the suffering, with all the persecution, with all the misunderstanding, and with all the attacks of the enemy, they still encourage you to stay with the Lord, to stand in the Lord, and to stand on the doctrine, in the word of God, never to look back, never to compromise, never to yield to any discouragement. Are they friends that are helping you to be fully prepared for the glory of God, to be fully prepared for heaven? Or are they people that are telling you to backslide? Are they people that are telling you, if somebody did that like that to me in the church, I would leave God, I would leave the church? Are those good friends? Think of the friends you have. Think of the friends you have. Are they people that know the Lord, love the Lord, and love the people of God? And are they people that will keep on exhorting, counseling, advising, encouraging you to move on and keep on in the Lord? If people do not love the Lord, why are they still very close to you? If people are discouraging you from following after the Lord, why are they still your intimate, close associate? Carefully and prayerfully consider the friends you have.